In the spirit of reconciliation, I'm happy to offer the land acknowledgement today. I respectfully acknowledge our OCS offices are located on the traditional lands and gathering place for Treaty 6 and 7, regions 3 and 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. These lands are the home of diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities today. Today, we welcome the OCS's own Dr. Andrew Paul. Andrew has been working as an aquatic ecologist in Western Canada for 30 years. His work has encompassed the fields of conservation biology, community restoration, non-native species invasions, population ecology, and river ecology. Andrew uses quantitative methods to aid in understanding ecological patterns or processes and has worked with the Theoretical Population Dynamics Group at the University of Amsterdam and the Fisheries Centre at the University of British Columbia. After spending 15 years with Alberta Fish and Wildlife studying environmental flows before coming to the Alberta Office of Chief Scientist to support scientific excellence in government, uh, Andrew is an adjunct professor at the University of Calgary in the Department of Biological Sciences and a member of the Science Advisory Board for the Trinity River Restoration Program in California. Now over to you, Andy. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. I'm going to start off with an outline of my talk, and I, I often don't like giving outlines to what I'm going to talk about. It's sort of like going to see a movie and uh, having someone explain the movie to you as you're walking in in, in the doors. Uh, but there's a lot I want to cover today, so I, I, I am going to... Uh, I am going to ruin the whole plot for you today by give, giving my outline. So the first part I want to talk about is fairly standard. What's the question um, that, that, that I'm going to be looking at? What is the data we have to address that question? Uh, and I'm sure to be everyone's favorite part, I want to talk a little bit about the statistical analysis to look at this data uh, and then present the results. Uh, but from there, I want to kind of switch into um, a bit of a different gear, and that is um, start exploring um, more of the social side, I guess, behind um, um, some some of this work. And, you know, I, I've called myself a, a, an applied ecologist um, for going on 30 or more years right now. And I'm still realizing that I'm not entirely sure what I mean when I say I'm an applied ecologist. And I'm learning how, how to actually do that. Uh, as I go on. So I think I'm going to call this my, my six-step program to becoming a, a, a better applied ecologist, or at least for me to try to become a better applied ecologist. So the question, um, this is a, a, an article that appeared in, in a newspaper in, in St. Paul, Paul in 2019, um, looking at uh, the fishing regulations that came up uh, in that year. Uh, and, and the reporter that uh, put the article together interviewed uh, numerous different stakeholders um, that were concerned about, about the fishing regulations. And one of the stakeholder groups had um, uh, presented uh, this concern that, um, that uh, harvest of walleye population should actually be increased to allow for the recovery of declining pipe perch in, in, in Lake Whitefish and several of the lakes. Um, so it kind of poses or presents the, uh, the fairly ob obvious question in, in that the too many walleye result in too few pike. And we can call this um, a negative interaction hypothesis. Uh, and if, uh, if we had some data that had densities of walleye shown here on the, uh, on the figure, I think I need to point at this graph, uh, where we on the x-axis, we have some measure or index of, of walleye densities. Uh, and then on the y-axis, some measure or index of, of pike densities. If we collect a bunch of data from lakes uh, uh, through time, if our data falls into this region A here, um, that would be consistent with, consistent with the negative interaction hypothesis. Uh, when we have few walleye, we have abundant pike and vice versa. When we have abundant walleye, we have few pike. Um, and uh, of course, it's uh, correlative data. Correlation does not imply causa causation, but it would be at least consistent with a negative interaction hypothesis. If all of our data fell in this region B in, in the bottom left corner, where we have a uh, few of both species, that would suggest that um, uh, this negative interaction hypothesis may not 
uh, be occurring um, or uh, and or I should say, um, there's other factors limiting the populations. If all of our data falls in region C, where there's abundance of both species, I like to call this the, the rainbows and lollipops region. Um, I, I mean, it's fascinating if the data is there, but as far as, far as um, hey, everything looks great, both species are abundance, no, uh, there's, there's no concern. So region C, not consistent with the hypothesis, but also um, not consistent with there being a concern being presented by, by, by stakeholders. Well, what data do we have to, to kind of fill in this region, see if there's consistency with this negative interaction hypothesis? Well, fisheries biologists uh, with, with the province have been collecting this, this amazing data set over the last 23 years. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, that they use what's called the fall index netting um, program. It follows a standardized sampling methodology uh, that's used elsewhere in North America. They've um, followed this technique across those 23 years. Uh, it's been published uh, from, from other jurisdictions as, as well as uh, results from that work published uh, from Alberta as well. So a, a really great uh, data set. It started in 2000 uh, and uh, today's analysis, I'm gonna actually present um, uh, the most recent data. So right from 2000 up to uh, 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 last year, 2022. I just want to give a handout or shout out to those fisheries biologists that, that collect this, this data. Not always is the weather like it is in this bottom right photo, uh, blue skies. They're doing this work in, in September, uh, early October. Uh, and as you can see from the photo on the left, I think that's ice freezing onto the floater coat of the person pulling in the nets there. This is not always glamour glamorous work. Uh, it can be difficult. These crews are very competent in what they're doing uh, and, and really skilled. So I am really able to work um, from this amazing data that, that, that they've been collecting. And this data has been uh, collected from a number of lakes across Alberta. Um, with the question at hand, I wanted to look at lakes that had known populations of pike. So there's 138 different lakes that they've sampled across those 23 years that have known pike populations. And in those 138 lakes, there's been 456 surveys done across the year. So that just means that there's been multiple surveys in some of those lakes uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, uh, in, in different years. So some lakes have been sampled uh, maybe only once, but uh, quite a number of lakes have been sampled um, two or more times uh, across those different different years. And this data is actually available or a summary of this data is available um, uh, to, 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 to everyone. It's, it's uh, openly available. If you were to go to Google, type in Alberta Finn summaries, uh, you will get this hit with, um, showing the fall index netting summaries. You can go on there. I believe the data goes back about 10 years, um, some, somewhere in there, uh, and you can look to see if a lake you're interested in there has, uh, has the information available. Uh, you can click on that lake and you will get a summary report for the lake, uh, which I'm showing here. Uh, uh, so this is Iosigan Lake uh, in 2020. The bottom one is uh, Buck Lake in, in 2013. And there will be the net summary data for both pike and walleye that were collected in, in that year. And that's what's shown in these uh, nice little colored plots uh, in, in the uh, uh, upper right corners of these, these plots. It shows the, uh, the catches of um, uh, uh, fish in the nets. And it also shows um, the catches relative to um, kind of broad management targets that uh, that fisheries managers are are using, and, and uh, in general, it, it's not um, uh, uh, the case for all lakes now, Alberta. But in general, the target that uh, managers are shooting for is is this uh, yellow region that you see in 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 these uh, in these plots. So that's where they're shooting to uh, hope um, uh, the fish populations uh, fall in in that region. If they're not, then they look at um, uh, changing the regulations or, or or other factors to try and achieve those those targets. So data is available, uh, or the summary data is available um, to everyone on online uh, uh, as we speak. So to switch, and this is this will be a very short <laughs> uh, discussion on statistical methods, and um, you know they're actually becoming quite standard now. Um, but I, I think it is good to 
uh, just to review them. So we're all kind of working on uh, on the same page or same understanding as I as I go through this uh, the actual data. Uh, and the two techniques I want to talk about, uh, the first one is quantile regression. And to explain this, um, I'm going to work with simulated data. So this is data that I have just made up or I've had the computer um, generate for me. So I can control all the variables that are going in here and see if I can get back um, the actual mechanisms that, that I programmed in to generate this data. So in this simulated example i'm just saying there's some measure of density count of a species this could be that's on the y-axis here this could be count of fish per standard net night uh, if you if you wish and i wanted to, to look at the relationship between the density of our um, species of interest uh, as a function of sediment concentration um, so that's what's on on the <clears throat> x-axis here and completely hypothetical relationship that that i i made up I also included in this simulation, so I, I'm going to say we're interested in the relationship between the density of the species and sediment, uh, and so we measure density, we measure sediment, but I introduced a second unknown variable. It was known to me because um, I, I was creating the simulation, but I can say we weren't able to measure it when we were collecting this data. So there's a third unknown unmeasured variable in, in this data that's creating um, uh, the extra dispersion or the extra variance you're seeing here. So, uh, you know, you can see from this graph, if sediment is low, so if there's low concentrations of sediment, then there could be quite a range of densities that this species could, could take. It could reach um, relatively high densities to, to, to what we're seeing in the data. At the same time, you could still see quite low densities as well. And that would just reflect cases where this third or, or no, second unmeasured variable is, is having effect and limiting it because it wasn't measured. I'm not able to control for that variance uh, in, in, in my data. If sediment concentrations increase, you can see the scope for densities start uh, uh, shrinks down. So species can never re reach high densities um, at these higher sediment concentrations. So if we're interested in the sediment density relationship in this data. How do we get at that relationship when we have this extra variance? And quantile regression is, is a tool that can help, help do that. So what am I showing here? Again, the simulated example, the dotted blue line is the true, this is the relationship that I programmed into the simulation between the count of the species and the sediment concentrations. The green lines in here are Two different um, quantile regressions. The bottom green line, the one at the bottom, is the median regression line. So this is the 50th quantile. So it's a regression through the uh, through the median of the data. The upper line is a regression through the 99th quantile of, of the data. So the upper um, quantile of, of the data. And you can see in this case that that upper quantile is capturing the true sediment relationship <clears throat> that that we're observing. So again, when we're interested in a particular relationship between some response variable, density in this case, and an explanatory variable, sediment, and we want to know that relationship in particular, quantile regression can be a useful tool that allows us to uh, account for that variance that's going to be introduced through other um, unmeasured variables that we, we don't know about. So quantile regression, quite um, quite useful tool. The red line that I've shown in, in this plot is just a standard linear regression model fit to it. It's it's a Poisson regression in this case with, with extra dispersion to allow for that extra variance, but you can see that it's not giving us back our true relationship, which is shown by that, that blue dotted line. I said there was two concepts, statistical concepts, I wanted to uh, try and present today. That quantile regression was number one. The second one is, is uh, mixed models. You'll see this uh, referred to as multi-level models, hierarchical models. This is any case where we have some kind of hierarchical or structure in our data. It often appears from when we take repeated samples or nested samples within, within different units. It is safe to say um, for most ecological data collected, the norm would be you're dealing with some sort of hierarchical structure in your data, and you most likely probably need to account for that in your analysis. Um, again, this is uh, shouldn't be um, uh, new ideas to most of the folks on this on this call, 
but not accounting for that structure in your data can lead to um, lead to problems. And again, I just want to illustrate this with uh, a simulated example. And I'll carry forward the simulation that I, I've been showing. This is our relationship between our count of the hypothetical fish and sediment, um, but let's introduce structure in our data. And in this case, we're going to introduce another variable, and that is lake productivity. So we're going to say there's 20 lakes that we're sampling from, and we're going to take repeated samples from some of those lakes. Um, and of the lakes are low productive, so they're going to have lower densities of fish just, just by other factors in that lake, um, whatever it might be, lower phosphorus concentration, colder, who knows, um, uh, you can, whatever you wish to make those lakes lower productivity. And the same, another 10 lakes, uh, or the other 10 lakes would be higher uh, productive lakes, so they will just naturally have higher concentrations of our species. So again, we can do the simulation, look at the data, uh, and I've split the data here, the, the, or the, 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 our high and low productivity lakes into different color groupings. So the greenish dots in here uh, on the left side of the plot, these are our lower productive lakes. The, whatever that is, blue fuchsia colored lakes are, are high, higher productivity lakes. Uh, so you can see that separation. Let's say we didn't think, we didn't have that structure in here. Uh, we just plotted all of these data points, and many of them are repeated samples from the same lakes, and we just colored all of these things as black dots. If you looked at this plot as a bunch of black dots, you would probably say, oh my God, there is no relationship between uh, set or almost no relationship, maybe some kind of hump shaped pattern, but there's almost no relationship between sediment and the count of our, our species. That is not accounting for structure in the data. If we introduced these multi-level models, hierarchical structure, where we account for repeated measures being taken from uh, the different experimental units, or in this case, the, the, the different lakes, then we can start to get that information back. So we, again, we can apply our quantile regression to this lake, um, look at the upper quantiles. Um, so that's what I'm showing by these thin lines in the plot here. This is just the lake specific upper quantile, 99th quantile for the relationship between the species count and sediment. And we are getting back the true relationship that I introduced in this simulation um, from the data. So uh, rather than looking at our data in despair, um, once we start to account for the structure in our data uh, appropriately, we can start to get information back. The thick red line in this plot is again just a standard regression plot to this data, a GLM fit to the data, and it could uh, it would be the same regression if I fit it to the, the, the lake memes. We can see kind of a scary thing happening here. Uh, you know, it's a very weak relationship, but we can see a positive relationship uh, between sediment and uh, our count of the species. Uh, when we look at the between lake effect, this line is increasing, and it is significant in this case, we, uh, you know, weakly significant, but it is a significant positive relationship. Whereas in the within lake effect, we're seeing a negative decline. Uh, from a statistical standpoint, this is quite fascinating. Uh, it's been recognized bef before for, uh, for a while. It's been referred to as Simpson's paradox. Uh, <clears throat> more recent work um, by Judea Pearl, um, they said, well, you no, know, it's, it's, it's not a paradox. People just aren't thinking about their data correctly. Uh, once you start appropriately thinking about how the data might be generated, then there can be a clear explanation. So we shouldn't call it paradox. We should call it a Simpson's reversal. Uh, most, most times you will see this referred to as, uh, as Simpson's paradox, but as I said, Judea Pearl is saying, no, we should rephrase this as Simpson's reversal. But it does create this fascinating, <laughs> fascinating issue that we need to know something about how this data may, may have arised given this uh, structure to it. All right. Um, almost end of the statistical discussion here. The last part I just want to say is, well, why are we talking about quantile regression and mixed models for uh, for today's um, seminar? Uh, quantile regression, because my the data that I have available um, is numbers of walleye, which we think is the explanatory, or could be an explanatory variable, a response variable, number of pike. We most likely think there are many other unmeasured variables or other things I didn't account for in this model that could be explaining densities of, of pike. That is just sensible thinking. So the use of quantile regression to um, 
uh, look at this data makes makes some sense. We're using a multi-level or mixed uh, mixed model approach um, because we have repeated samples taken from uh, from our lakes. And the, the graph on the bottom left here just shows the number uh, of uh, fin surveys that occur um, uh, for each of the lakes. So about seventy percent of these. 138 lakes that I mentioned have two or more surveys that happened uh, in the last 23 years. Uh, and in fact, a couple of lakes um, right over on the, the uh, far right side of this plot actually had 15, sam uh, 15 survey years over those uh, 23 years. So um, there are a few lakes that have been surveyed more often than, than every other year. So we have definitely have repeated measures, we have structure to our data that we have to account for. All right, we're armed with, armed I think with a, enough statistics for now that we can start start looking at uh, looking at this data. So if you think back to my first hypothetical plot of region A and here's where we think uh, the data is consistent with a negative interaction hypothesis, that's how I'm gonna try and lay this out now in this, in, in this plot. So on the x-axis, this is the index of density of walleye. It's just going to be represented as the catch of walleye per standard net night of these from these fin surveys in a particular lake for that given year. Uh, the y-axis, the response that we're interested in is the catch of northern pike um, for these standard net nights. Again, this is an index of density. Uh, and now we can just fill in, fill in the data into this plot. And each of the individual little points here are just one of those lake survey years. Um, so there's 456 of these points um, shown here, collected over those 23 years. Um, just for illustration, I've colored a few of those points just to show three different lakes. There, there are, of course, many, 138 other different lakes in here. I didn't color them all different colors because this would look like a, some kind of kaleidoscope and difficult to read. But, the, you know, the red Dots here, this is Pigeon Lake, um, so samples from Pigeon Lake. The black dots in the figure are samples from uh, surveys, uh, these fin surveys from uh, Lac La Biche. And the green dots are um, surveys from Wabaman Lake. So I've just picked three lakes that people are probably most, most familiar with. The black lines, the thick black lines in this plot represent these quantile uh, regressions. And this is the... Uh, uh, quantile is going from the median, that's the bottom line here, to the upper 99th quantile, which is the upper uh, uh, black line in, in, in this plot. So when we look at this between lake effect, we can see that when walleye densities are low, when we're on the left-hand side of this plot, pike densities can achieve a range of densities, including um, relative to what we've seen in across these 456 surveys, quite high densities. Same time, there's no guarantee that they're going to be uh, high, they might, they might be low. Again, using this uh, thinking of quantile regression suggests that there are other factors um, that could be potentially limiting pike densities as well. That doesn't seem too surprising. On the other end of this plot, when walleye densities are high, we never see high densities of northern pike. So this is consistent um, in consistent with that negative interaction hypothesis. We're not uh, uh, high densities of both species uh, uh, occurring, but a negative relationship between. Well, that's that's kind of fascinating. You'll also notice on this plot, I drew these thin little gray lines out here. This is that within lake effect. So the thick black lines, this is across lakes, the relationship. You can also look within those lakes, and that's what's shown here with these thin little lines. This is just for the 90th quantile. We, I could show it for the 99th quantile, and it would look very similar. If I plotted them both on this plot at the same time, it would be filled up with a whole bunch of gray and difficult to read. What you will know, and what you'll notice is that this is a positive relationship when we look at the within lake effect. So as what within lakes, as walleye densities go up. There is a slight but increasing trend in the pike densities. It's a slight trend, but it is actually significant in here. And this is, as I was explaining before, this whole concept or, or this idea of Simpson's reversal. We're having a different um, within lake between lake effect. Well, uh, Judea Pearl said we need to think something about the, the data generation 
generating process. So the obvious question we all have is, well, uh, which is the real one? <laughs> or which, which one is showing the effect of walleye on, on pike? Well, to answer that, we have to um, look, at the, look at this a little deeper, look at the data generating processes. Uh, I'll use these, um, uh, well, these are called directed acyclic graphs to, uh, to kind of to, to get at this. And I'm gonna look at a couple of cases. So let's look at the first case. And let's say there is some unmeasured variable, and let's call that macrophyte cover, and it varies among lakes. So each lake has some different macrophyte cover, and that creates lake-specific habitat for pike or walleye that's either going to be good for pike and bad for walleye, or vice, per vice versa, good for walleye and not, not good for pike, bad for pike. If this unmeasured measured variable is creating habitat at the lake effect, and it doesn't change across years or doesn't change in general across years, so we have this grouping effect that occurs before the interaction that we're interested in, and the interaction we're interested in is this effect of what's the potential effect of walleye on pike. If the grouping of variable occurs before this interaction effect that we're uh, wanting to look at, then we should look at the within lake effect if we want to determine what's the impact of walleye on pike. All right, so that's telling us, well, we should be looking at the thin gray lines in the, in the previous plot. That's the, uh, uh, that, 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 that's what uh, is representing the effect of walleye on pike. Let's call that case A. Interestingly enough, we can create another um, process that would lead to this Simpsons reversal. And in this case, let's say that again, there's some unmeasured variable, but this time it's harvest. So the number of fish of both species that are taken out of the lake, and that is the number of fish that you take out or harvest from the lake is going to depend in part on the number of walleye and pike in the lake. Obviously harvest is gonna depend on other variables. I haven't shown it in, in this little plot here, it's such as how many people are out there angling, how many uh, are fishing in, in general, how many are they harvesting, all that kind of stuff. But uh, if we're interested in this effect of walleye on pike uh, and our grouping effect, this lake effect occurs after that interaction of uh, 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 importance or what we're trying to look at, if it occurs after, in that case, we actually want to use the between lake effect to determine this impact of walleye on pike. So let's call this case B. Case B is saying, we should focus on those thick black lines in the previous plot, which says there's a negative relationship uh, between the two species. So you're probably hoping <laughs> uh, in my talk, I'm gonna be able to tell you, uh, is case A or case B the correct, uh, correct hypothesis, the correct data generating process? Because the data I've been looking at up to this point is, uh, you know, it's just correlated data. It's, it's what's been observed in those lakes. I don't have enough information in that data to separate case A from case B. And, you know, there could be case C, which is some combination of, 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 of these two together as, as well, one might propose. I can't separate between these two causes. Normally, as a good scientist, we would say, and this is a correct thing to say as a scientist, more study is needed to be able to separate these, um, <clears throat> separate the potential causes. And this could be um, looking at additional data, um, doing, uh, you know, like the gold standard would be doing, um, you know, adaptive management type experiments to, uh, to, to, to sort this out. That is a good thing to say as a scientist. I started this talk as a six step program to becoming a better applied ecologist. And I, I, I don't apply or imply here that applied ecology is not science, but it is a science being applied to specific questions. And as an applied ecologist, we have to think about the value of, of that collecting or, or proceeding with that additional um, uh, work to collect that information. And there's a tool we can use to quantitatively look at the value of collecting that information. This is um, being referred to in the literature as the expected value of, of information. Uh, I, I just included a paper here that came out in 2015, a method in ecology and evolution. It, it's a really good paper um, that talks about um, expected value of information, how you would collect it, uh, how you can adapt it to um, 
uh, separate perfect information from sampling information. Uh, this paper is not the invention of this technique. It's been around for uh, at least 40 years, if, if not longer. Uh, but this is just a, a, a really nice um, discussion of it and applied uh, and used for applied uh, ecologists. So I, I definitely recommend looking at it. I do, I'm not able to, in this talk, um, go into the details of how this is done, but very briefly, um, essentially, it, it depends on looking at, uh, you know, what is the payoff given a certain decision you might make? What's the probability of that event happening? And if you know those two things, you can figure out the expected value that you're gonna get, get from it. As you change decisions, you can just look at the change in those expected values. And that gives you how much, uh, you know, what is the increase in your uh, expected value uh, as you learn new things and are able to change your decision. That was a very, very rapid explanation of expected. Look at that other paper I, I uh, just presented to, to get a much better explanation of how this is done. But we can apply this thinking to our um, uh, pipe walleye problem. So we can, if we had some payoff given certain decisions, we can apply that to the probability of an event happening and how strong that event is. And we can take that by looking at our case B of um, uh, 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 results. And this is when we had a negative relationship between like, so we, and we're just saying, let's say case B is true. True, We know this, if case B is true, we know what the distribution of that um, uh, strength of the interaction is because we can observe the, the, the slopes from that, um, uh, from that analysis. And that's all I'm showing here. This is just a, a, a you know, bootstrap distribution of what that between lake slope parameter could be. From that, we can calculate it expected value. We can look at how that change in expected value, would, um, uh, what that change would be as we go to different decisions. The difficulty in doing this analysis is this first part of the equation. What's the payoff? How do you define payoff? And this is defining what the objective is for this for the system. Um, you know, often we like to think in in in, in dollars and cents. Um, that doesn't always apply to uh, 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 some ecological problems. So in this case, I define the payoff as the total angler catch rate. So this is the uh, what what people are going to catch how. Uh, the rate at which they're catching fish of either pike or walleye uh, in, in a given system. So how, how easy is it to catch a fish if you go out fishing for the day? Total angler catch rate. And this would be for pike and walleye com combined. I made up this objective. Um, you know, it's not a totally unreasonable objective. There's a, a fair bit of work. There's some work that shows that, um, yes, uh, you know, anglers have different um, uh, goals that they're trying to achieve when they're going out or objectives they're trying to achieve, but quite often um, uh, uh, the, the utility of a system is expressed as how many fish was I able to catch in a day. And there's been some studies that show that, that that's a reasonable measure of, of payoff. So that's what I used. Um, payoff measured is total angler catch rate. All right, let's apply this to our um, pike walleye problem. So we have to start with an, in, an initial density of, um, of our walleye and pike. So that's all the X and the Y axis is um, shown in this plot here. What would it be our starting? Uh, what if our starting density of walleye was, was low and our starting density of pike was high? What would be the expected value in, of information? In, in that case, and then we can look at this at different um, uh, regions of this, this plot. I just discretized it into, into different regions. Um, so essentially what we're asking, if we know case B is true, how much do we need to reduce the walleye that, uh, to allow us to increase our overall total catch rates and hence increase our overall objective or payoff for, uh, for the system? So the center of this figure, we're going to fill in with two things. The first thing is these numbers that are in each one of these little grid cells. This is how much we need to reduce the walleye by. Uh, so this, in this case, would be reduced walleye by 50%. Um, so you can see those numbers range from zero to, to 95%. The colors in this graph represent how much does the angler catch rate increase? How much does your payoff increase if you follow um, this decision now that you have um, uh, uh, perfect information of the system, if you know um, case B is, is true. And that's what's represented by the, the colors in this plot. So a dark 
blue to dark blue represents a 20 to 30 percent increase in your overall angler catch rates um, if you were to reduce the walleye population by by a given amount all right let's decipher this plot a little bit first off we can just eliminate part of this graph altogether right off the bat and that is this upper right region here why did i eliminate that this is where we have high initial starting densities of walleye and in high initial starting densities of northern pike. If you remember from our data, we never saw any lakes or any of these lake survey years in that region. This is the lollipops and rainbows region where both species are high density and, and everyone's happy. I, I hate to I, I hate, uh, hate to break it to everyone. That just doesn't exist in the data that we have. So. This region out here doesn't exist. The other thing to notice from this graph is that the reduction, so that's the numbers inside these squares, is quite large. It ranges from 50 to 95% reduction in the walleye population. That's a huge, yeah, it's essentially, uh, it's not extirpating the population, but it's drastically reducing the walleye population. Why are those numbers so, so great? Well, if you think back to this, uh, the data that I was showing you and that this, um, uh, 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 quantile regressions. What it's saying is that when your starting population of walleye is somewhere in kind of in this intermediate density, you need to push them all the way down to the far left end of this plot so that you can potentially see um, one of uh, this large, uh, potentially again, see this large increase in the pike population. So you need to push your walleye population quite far to the left in order to see the pike population increase and get an overall increase in your uh, in your catch rates. So reductions in walleye would need to be quite large. The other thing to notice from this graph is look at this region where we have low densities of, of pike. Uh, so this this you know <clears throat> these bottom squares here we're starting at a low density of pike. In those regions it's, saying, regions, it's saying your best strategy is not to reduce the walleye population. You're not seeing much of an increase in your overall catch rates if you get rid of walleye. And if you think about it, so essentially what this is saying is uh, you don't have many pike in your population. Your catch rate now is largely being supported by walleye. Um, it doesn't make sense to get rid of your walleye to hope you flip that to now having an overall higher catch rate on pike. Uh, you're better off <laughs> uh, keeping what, what you have. So the take home from all of this analysis is that if your objective is overall catch rates of anglers for both species, pike and walleye, there's actually I, I, the discrepancy between case A and case B um, it's interesting, scientifically interesting, but if your objective is these overall catch rates, then it doesn't make sense to do further studies for, for case, case B. As an applied ecologist, if our goal is increased total catch rates, don't keep studying the system. Cool. It's interesting. Life is never that simple, is it? Back to our data. Uh, that I was showing here, and, and, and I, as I told you before, I, I threw on a couple of, or a couple, I threw on three specific lakes. The green dots are Wabamon Lake. Why did I put Wabamon Lake on this on this plot? Well, turns out Alberta's chief scientist actually lives on Wabamon Lake, um, and he also likes to to uh, to fish for for pike. Also, turns out the chief scientist is my boss, um, so we tend to have lots of discussion about this data. And if you look at the time series in this, this Wabam data, you can see, so this is just the years of sampling, 07, so the earlier years, 07 and 2010. This is a case where there are no walleye in the net catches, um, but a, a number of pike. The number of pike increased at the same time walleye were increasing. And then you can see by 2020, walleye densities have increased um, to their highest, highest level, well, from zero to their highest level. And pike populations have um, in the net catches almost just disappeared. Very few pike in the net catch rates. If we look at a little bit of the history of, of walleye um, uh, in Wabam Lake, uh, they've had a, I'll say, a storied history over the last 100, 100 120 years. We do know from early records, uh, commercial records, that uh, they were that there's reports of catching walleye. 
um, in the early 1900s from Wabamum Lake. Um, then their appearance seems to be somewhat sporadic or not present. They were stocked in the mid 40s uh, or in the 40s and 50s, stocked again in the 1980s, um, <clears throat> showed up in anglers catch rates for a little while, then seemed to have uh, dis disappeared from the lake again. Uh, until 2010, there was again a, a concerted effort to stock both adults uh, in walleye into the lake. Uh, adults moved over from Lac St. Anne, as well as um, Isle, uh, nearby Isle Lake, uh, followed by stocking of fry and fingerling over the, uh, the following four years. And again, if we, this is just looking at that net data again that I showed previously, I've now just broken up into different size classes. The, Orange lines here are pike, the blue lines of walleye. Uh, it's just a nice illustration. You can see it 2007, 2010. Pike are in our uh, uh, net catches. There are no walleye. They start to show up in 2013 uh, in the net catch. Um, so this is three years after the initial introductions, some stocking. And by 2020, uh, almost no pike in the net catches and lots of, of walleye uh, in those net catches. Uh, as an angler, um, you can see this has gone from fishing for pike to 2020, fishing for walleye, you know, in the size range of 30 to 40 centimeter uh, walleye. If you're a trophy pike fishery, this is quite a change in your fishery. Uh, the other thing you can look at um, for Wabam Lake is you uh, what we call condition factor of fish. This is just big, at a given size, how um, skinny or fat is a is is a walleye, and we can look at look at it over all of the years of of, of sampling from that lake. So that was five years of sampling, um, just an ANCOVA analysis. We see there's a significant effect in the latter latter years of the uh, of the data. 2013, 2015. 2020, there was only four pike caught, so that's why it's not significant in 2020 because there's just so few pike caught, you can't really develop the regression line. Uh, what this data is telling us, for example, if you caught a 750 millimeter fish, in 2007, it would have weighed about 3.1 kilograms. Uh, in 2015, it would have weighed on average about 2.6 kilograms, 15% less. You can see it in these photos here. If you show up at work weighing 15% less, your coworkers are going to notice that and wonder what is going on and be concerned about your uh, concerned about your health. So, when I talk to a pike fish, uh, <coughs> fisherman, fisher person, uh, and say, "Well, there's no value in studying." Uh, case B to figure out if this negative relationship is caused by uh, within or between lake effects uh, and what it might mean to management. When I make that conclusion, it's entirely predicated on this payoff or on the objective we're, we're, we're searching for. If you have a different objective, if it's not total catch rates, then the answer to whether you should study it will change as well. Right. Just to wrap up fairly quickly here. I gave this presentation about a month ago um, to the University of Calgary, the biology department at the University of Calgary. Um, and I got a question from Dr. Fred Rona, who is Alberta's former chief scientist uh, about reference conditions in, in Lake. And um, I answered Fred quite well. I think I botched my answer to Fred's question. Uh, on this reference conditions, but Fred got me thinking about, about this quite a bit over the intervening month. Uh, and reference conditions are used by fisheries managers to set their management targets. And it's done by species by species. So a reference condition is set for, uh, for walleye and it's based on the upper percentile or quantile of observed walleye densities just looking at walleye. The same thing is done for uh, the upper uh, observed densities of northern pike. So this kind of represents a ideal or uh, I think of an ideal or pristine carrying capacity from these systems. And from those reference conditions, these uh, management targets are established. And if you think back to those um, little fin sur surveys or summaries I gave you before, the reference condition is what is used to define this border between the light green and the dark green line. That's uh, this kind of ideal or pristine condition. The management target is then based on some, uh, you know, uh, a thought through percentage of that reference condition, which defines the yellow 
zones. And this is done on a species by species basis. So we can look at these management targets in our data. That's all I'm showing here is the yellow region. So the horizontal bar here is the management target for pike. The vertical bar management target for walleye. Again, these are single species. We can look at, well, how many times do we achieve our management targets for both species at the same time? Not many times. In fact, out of these 456 surveys, we have about a 2% success rate. That is <clears throat> our chance of being either in this yellow, combined yellow zone or greater um, uh, is only about 2%. What this is illustrating is it appears to be a management trade-off between pike and walleye. Um, <clears throat> you can't have it, can't have your cake and eat it too, something along those, those, those lines might be the correct saying along there. There's a trade-off in management targets between these. Well, now that I've been um, questioned by the chief scientists of past and present, I'm, I'm feeling a little nervous and, and figure I better prepare for a visit from the chief scientists of the future. And I want to explore this idea of ecological balance. Um, and I start this off with, if, uh, this is a study out of 1977 uh, from Ontario. It looked at species association of five common predatory fishes uh, in, in Ontario. So this is uh, walleye, pike, lake trout, smallmouth bass. And it turns out the walleye pike association, so when those two species are sympatric, is the most common type of uh, lake uh, that's observed in, in Ontario. They have lived in sympatry for at least 10,000 years, if not longer. Um, so it makes question, well, maybe they, this is just those 553 lakes are just a fluke of um, ecological imbalance over uh, you know, many thousands of years until we could finally get them in, in back into balance with, with humans being present, or maybe something else is going on. This concept of ecological balance is not new to Alberta. This is an example of um, Goliath grouper in, in, in Florida, threatened species, regulations put on to recover the Goliath grouper uh, uh, in, in coral reefs off the uh, coast of uh, Florida had have been having very good success in the recovery of those species. So Goliath grouper have been increasing. At the same time, those, those grouper have been increasing. There's been concerns from uh, angling groups that a decline in other sport fishes, uh, which they've observed, is caused by this recovery of, of grouper. Uh, the study in fishery showed that there, there's no competitive or predatory interaction between grouper and these other um, fishes of uh, sport fishing uh, interest. So there's unlikely to be any kind of interaction going on. So this ecological balance doesn't seem to be supported uh, or isn't supported by, uh, by, 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 by the data and by the information from the system. It was Daniel Kahneman, uh, you know, famous behavioral economist, uh, Nobel laureate that said, understanding whether people's perceptions are true or false is not, not there's nothing interesting or useful in that. Understanding what they are the truth of is relevant. Uh, and that's what I wanted to spend the last three slides, uh, two slides uh, looking at. First off, we can look at what anglers have reported catching um, from lakes in Alberta over the last 40 years. And that's just summarized in the following plot here by decade. The numbers below the bar charts represent the number of lakes where um, angler interviews were done, uh, we call them uh, creel surveys. So in, you can see in, 19, in the 1980s, there were 27 lakes in that decade uh, with angler creel surveys. Each creel survey at a lake would consist of hundreds of interviews with anglers asking how many fish did you catch? Uh, if they harvested fish, they, uh, they would show the, the, the creel attendant how many fish they caught and they would tell the creel attendant how long they did fish for, which gives us these angler catch rates. What we can Quite quickly, what we can see from this data is that in the 1980s, Alberta anglers were catching about two pike for every walleye they were uh, they were catching. Uh, in the 2000s, not quite reverse, but almost two walleye for every pike they're catching. Perhaps more notably, is that the catch rate for walleye has gone up by about fourfold. It took about five hours to catch a walleye back in the 80s. 
takes just under an hour to catch a walleye in the 2000s. That's a huge difference. At the same time, the pike reported catch rates of pike hasn't changed much, if anything, perhaps if increased, but if stayed, stayed more constant through the time. So what anglers are perceiving, what they're seeing has changed over that, that time. That will <clears throat> create different perceptions. The other thing is, again, understanding this objective. Photo on the left is a picture of me. Um, I am not holding a minnow species in this photo. I am actually holding a walleye from uh, a lesser slave lake. I am smiling in this photo because it took me until I was in my 30s before I actually was able to angle a walleye from a lake in Alberta. That's Jonathan on the right. He's smiling because that is just a fantastic bike. There's, <laughs> that's just a great fish. People have different objectives. Um, some people like catching fish, some specifically walleye, um, some people like trophy pike fishing. So I want to kind of end with this probably heretical view that this concept of ecological balance isn't a scientifically defined thing, but rather it's more of a social value. Um, and that's going to be based on people's interests and objectives, which differ. differ. So just to conclude, uh, yes, there is a negative, the data is consistent with a negative relationship between walleye and pike. It's only observed in the upper um, uh, quantiles of the data, about the upper 25% of, the, of, of um, these lake surveys where it was significant. The mechanism is uncertain. We have this case A and case B situation, so we don't know the mechanism. It's a correlative study, not a causative study. Um, but we do know from that data, if there was a, a mechanism that, um, uh, there was a, a, an actual causative negative relationship, reductions in walleye would need to be quite substantial to uh, increase the pike numbers, and that there's no guarantee of success. Further study isn't supported if your objective is overall ca angler catch rates, but if you have different objectives of the system, then all bets may be off, not guaranteed, may be off. Third one, um, <clears throat> management objectives uh, for pike and walleye should consider these species uh, in concert together and in inter interaction and, and that there is appears to be a trade-off between managing for walleye and pike and that should be factored in um, uh, uh, start to be factored into um, setting management objectives for uh, for these two species uh, so with that i will conclude the talk uh, mark i want to thank everyone for joining our science seminar today during the last months and even years for some of you. We really appreciate your participation. I also want to say a special thank you to the OCS's Janine Goring, uh, who works behind the scenes to make sure these science seminars run smoothly. Thank you so much, Janine. Today was the last seminar before our summer break, but we will be back with a new lineup of fantastic speakers in the fall. As a reminder, if you're not on our mailing list to receive invites to all future science seminars and would like to be added to it, or if your team has work that you would like to share at an upcoming science seminar, please contact the Office of the Chief Scientist at aep.ocs at gov.ab.ca. We'll end there for, day, for today. Thanks again, Andy, for sharing your work with us. And to everyone who tuned in, we will see you all in the fall.